And your morning. It's time now for Coach's Corner. Live from McDonald's on Madison's Hilltop, I'm Tim Torrance. Thanks for tuning us in. We do it every Saturday morning from the McDonald's across from the Madison High School. This week, we're going to kind of switch gears a little bit. We're going to talk basketball. But we're going to switch gears and talk NCAA men's basketball. Actually, we're going to talk about Selection Sunday, more specific. NCAA men's basketball bracketologist Dave Amon will join me. I think, Dave, for the third time you've been on the program. It's nice to have you on. It's a, a big busy, exciting time of the year for you. Yeah, absolutely, and I do believe, Tim, it is. It yeah. is time number three, so yeah. thanks for having me back. It's always... It's always... Well, and, and there are... <sighs> And I, I, you know, we we follow you on on Twitter, uh, <laughs> and it's kind of funny. You were telling some stories about that, but uh, big on Twitter. And again, the bracket guy Dave. Um, and I, I told you I, I've kind of followed some of your tweets a little closer this week to kind of get an idea of of things going on in the NCAA men's basketball world. Now, of course, my good friends Travis Calvert, Dave Campbell, they're big NCAA men's basketball. And Travis likes Kentucky, and Dave likes Kansas, and. Uh, but I don't, I don't keep up with it as much as I used to just because there's not enough hours in the day. So for a guy that, that may be looking to get some insight, okay, I'm going to fill out a bracket and, and I'm going to try to, to do the best I can to, to pick the, you know, the final four teams. What do they need to look for generally when, when if they're following you on Twitter? What, what are you talking about some of the times with, with some of your tweets and, and teams that maybe, you know, we talk bubble teams or teams that, that, that maybe be, you know, uh, a shoe in, but what seed are they going to be? How do, you, how do you figure all that out? Well, a lot of it, Tim, really is um, following what the guidelines that the actual selection committee uses. Mm -hmm. And we've been fortunate over the years because, say, in the last decade or so, maybe a little longer than that, they have become much more transparent, right. if you will, about how the process goes from teams being selected and then put into a seed list and then how that seed list is used to fill out the bracket mm -hmm. that we all see on selection Sunday night when we're either writing them in and we're printing them off. Right. And so that's really where my focus is. Now I'm a huge college basketball fan mm -hmm. and I love to fill out my bracket after I get it just like everybody else. Right. What I tell people though is that because they ask me that I say well I'll be honest with you I've had good years and I've had not so good years so um, I, I actually feel better about the process I do figuring out who I think is going to be in the bracket mm -hmm. before they announce it right more so than exactly who I can tell you I think is going to win once it comes out and and maybe no more so true than this year right I mean you know we've had a you know there have been a couple teams you know three or four that have been you know really consistent throughout the year but by and large you know it's mm -hmm. it's been one of those years where on any given night right right, right. so I think you're in a position again or, you know, we could have legitimately, you know, 12 to 15 teams with a chance, you know, to get to the Final Four this year. Right. And, and that doesn't count for one of those outliers that could happen, you know, right. a six, seven, or eight seed or something making a run, um, simply because there's not going to be a lot of difference, mm -hmm. right. you know, between right. those teams. And, and there's. There's four teams on a seed line, right? but that doesn't mean the team directly above them. So if you're looking at like a four seed, for example, the last three seed and the first five seed probably really aren't any different than the fours, right. but there has to be a minor tweak in there and a nuance as to why one is, you know, so if you're 20 on the seed list, you're a five, and if you're a 21 on the seed list, you're a six. People look at that, oh, well, they're a six seed and they're a five. Right, right. It's like, well, yeah, you're one spot different. Right. And and one spot different can make a big difference or maybe cannot make a big difference. I mean, it just, you know, it, yeah. and at the end of the day, Dave, and, and this is kind of my, my theory as, a, as an amateur looking at all this, is at the end of the day, boys on the court kind of determine everything. Absolutely. And so we're at a point where... You know, with the exception of a few conference tournaments that are already underway, mm -hmm. at this point in time, everybody's true conference tournament hasn't started, has a chance to make it. Right. Because the way it sets up, the conferences have decided, and a lot of people will blame the, the tournament. Well, it's actually the conference that decides who its champion is. Mm -hmm. So let's say, for example, the Big Ten went back to the NCAA and said, you know, we want our regular season champion to get our automatic bid. Okay. Right. 
but they're not going to do that because right. they want the money from the Big Ten tournament. Right. Exactly. Right. I mean, that's sure. that's big television bucks. It's big right. revenue bucks. It's you know right. people in the seats and everything going on. And it's back in Indy this year, and you know yeah. Banker's Life's going to be probably a sellout for right. the vast majority of those games. Sure. And so it's big money. It's big business. Right. The downside is, it, in, a, in, a, in a case of like the Big Ten or one of the power conferences, a lot of years it doesn't necessarily impact who's going to go. Mm -hmm. But I'll give you a perfect example where it can ultimately impact the strength of the bracket. So yesterday in the Missouri Valley, for example, people like to call it Arch Madness because it's in St. Louis every year. Right. Well, Northern Iowa has been the class of that league all year. Mm -hmm. They got upset yesterday in their quarterfinal by Drake. And Northern Iowa is now going to be into the at-large pool. And right. so they're going to have to be now compared against teams, say, like Cincinnati and Wichita State and Richmond and Utah State and a team like Purdue who's trying to right. fight to get back in. Right. And so how are they going to stack up mm -hmm. with some of those as a mid-major? Now, they had a really good start to their year, but that Drake loss isn't going to look so good because particularly right. it was by 20 points. Right. Rest, and it's just a bad day to have a bad day. Right. Right? right. Exactly. But so that's where we're probably not going to get. Mm -hmm the best team from the Missouri Valley representing them in the final field of 68. Right. I won't say today 100% that Northern Iowa won't make it, but they're looking like most likely they're going to end up being on the outside looking in, mm -hmm. depending on right. how this next week goes. Right. And so you're sending a a team that could have been potentially had they won out a, a low 11 seed. Mm -hmm. You know, or a 12 seed with a real good chance to beat a five if they play well. Right. To now, you're probably your rep could be a 13, 14, or 15 seed. Right. And so it does change the overall impact of how the bracket looks on that Sunday night a week from now. Losses in November are they more focused on losses than in February, March? Or a, or a, 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 a crucial loss in November still affects you today? How does that work? It's a great question. And several years ago, the committee used to have an official criteria called last 10 games. Mm -hmm. And so last 10 or 12. And they would consider as one of their factors, one of many, mm -hmm. how a team did in its last 10 or 12 games as sort of a reference point of how are you playing right. as we head into this. So you may have had a great resume, but if you've lost 10 of your last 12, maybe that's a consideration we should take. For a variety of reasons, they have opted now that has been removed from the equation. Mm -hmm. Now, if you and I were both on the selection committee, you could still place some value on that right. in how you vote mm -hmm. or how you discuss things in the room. Right. But at the same time, those men and women are also called to follow the criteria. And technically, that's not a criteria anymore. Right. So that leads me to here. When the committee looks at a team's team sheet, it's in totality. Mm -hmm. right. So a November win counts as much as a February win. Mm -hmm. And a November loss counts as much right. as a February loss. Right. So it's kind of the picture of the whole. Mm -hmm. These are basketball people. They understand that, you know, people have a bad night, right? right. And sometimes they have a great night. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you take away the best, and you take away the worst, right. and the real team probably lies somewhere in the middle. In the middle, right? right. Yeah. Where they most consistently are. Yeah. And that's why we tell people, <clears throat> not that one great win probably matters a little more mm -hmm. than one bad loss right. because it you're proving who you can beat. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. It, it, as I've heard said, you know, anybody can lose. Mm -hmm. The question is, who can you beat? Right. Can you beat teams that are going to be in the field? Mm -hmm. And so that is another thing that the, the committee will look at. So, yeah, I have a, some wins against the lower end of quad two. And, you know, I have a good record against quad two. Well, how many of those teams are NCAA teams? Right. So those wins still matter. They're still good wins. Mm -hmm. But if you end up being along that cut line. Right. And you're measuring, but how many teams have you beaten that are going to probably be in the field right. or are in the field? Because mm -hmm. at some point you have to prove that you can beat somebody 
Um, so it, it all matters. You know, obviously Kentucky has that, you know, loss for fans around here of Evansville way back in the early year. And people say, well, is that, does that go away? No, it doesn't go away. But you also are going to look at Kentucky in its totality and that they've wrapped up an SEC championship. And granted, the SEC is not real deep. Mm -hmm you know, the way it looks right now. So, you know, the, you have to also look at what they did in non-conference. I mean, they also had some other really good wins. Right. So it's it's kind of a totality type of thing, but it doesn't just go away. It's like, well, the committee is going to pretend that didn't happen. No, that's not the case either. <laughs> Dave, let's go back and let's kind of look at the beginning for you. I know we, we've talked about this the, the previous two years, but we, we want to do it again. What in the world led you to do what you do? And this isn't a this isn't a full-time job for you, but this time of year it kind of is. It's it's a hobby that you do, and why, why would you get interested in this? Well, it is a hobby that um, over the years has taken on much more time. <laughs> uh, for a whole variety of reasons, right? Um, but and, and that's all. That's all part of it. There's a college basketball guy I follow who has a lot of these little uh, quips and sayings, and one of them is that you can get on a T-shirt now. It says, "We sleep in May." <laughs> you know, so that that's that. I'm getting close. Right. This this next week, I'm going to feel like I need to sleep the whole month of May, probably. Right. Um, but really, at the heart of it, Tim, I'm a college basketball fan, and I've been a college basketball fan since you know I was in high school. And you'd see the bracket come out, and you'd be like, well, you know, how did that happen? Right. So you kind of start tinkering around and trying to figure out. And, again, this is where in the last 15, 20 years the process has become, you know, much more transparent. Um, and so you kind of educate yourself on the the rules and, and how the, the bracketing process works per the NCAA and pick up nuances, and you kind of track it. And then it just kind of one of those things where I just kind of started doing it on the side just to see like how it would uh, come about you know and then in fairness you know you had the the Jerry Palms and the Joe Lenardi's of the world that kind of made it um, more of a household kind of thing right I mean you know at the forefront on a national level mm -hmm. right and so you kind of said well you know I'm curious to see what I would come up with if I did it and then one thing proverbial led to another and Lo and behold, here we are. <laughs> How many years? Well, I've probably been doing it, um, at least for myself, probably mm -hmm. close to 20. Yeah. Right. Um, but I launched Bracketville at the encouragement of some people to say, well, I'll take it on and, and throw it online and see what happens. In uh, 2008 was the first year. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to believe it's been wow. 12 years right. um, and been doing it for... Uh, NBC picked me up in 2010. Yeah, so it's been a decade. Does the does the exposure that you've increased exposure? Does it surprise you that you've gotten to be this this? Yeah, popular? I don't know what this is, and <laughs> you know when this goes away, that's all fine. Right. Um, it's fun. I think more than anything, Tim, what it is is there's a lot of college basketball fans who have a passion for this same thing mm -hmm. and so it's like a community right and so you get to interact with right. a lot of people wow. and a lot of really nice people that also do this mm -hmm. um, for varying different kinds of sites and organizations and groups or for themselves and and also do a very good job at it right and so being able to have those conversations on Twitter or whatever and then get to talk to mm -hmm. people like you and, and, and college basketball friends at, at various places around the country is yeah I mean it, it there's there's some there's a cool aspect to it I suppose it's a lot of fun yeah um, but you know with it also comes people want you to give them answers and sometimes like well I can give you my best educated guess right how about that yeah you know, and that, because and that's at the, the end of the day <clears throat> this isn't Dave's bracket right okay if it was Dave's bracket <laughs> It'd be real easy. I'd have no stress at all. Right. Right? Because right. I could tell you exactly what I would think that I would do if I were them. But the right. challenge is, and all of us that fall into this, and it's many people, mm. we're trying to get into the heads of the 10 men and women that are going to be in that committee room and trying to tell people what we think mm. 
they're going to do and how this is going to play out because that's really what the task is yeah. right and then to see how how it all works out in yeah. the end it's it's for you guys it's an educated guess it's it's this is what we think based on what we know right um, and, and again based on what you know um, doesn't necessarily mean that's how it's going to play out it doesn't mean that that's the way it's going to roll um, and again it's all a, a best guess a lot of times well you have 10 people in there who follow college basketball very closely at their task with it all year mm -hmm. they're debating and they're voting and we won't get into all of the nuances of that because you know that's 10 shows in and of itself right but, um, it's a very detailed process that they go through and you know you're trying to figure out particularly these last couple three teams I mean which way are they gonna go right and some of its experience mm -hmm. some of its leaning on what we know historically they have done in the past if there's been a precedent you know, I'll give you a perfect example. So, you know, right now there's Purdue fans out there thinking, are we going to be able to get in? Well, as we sit today, they're 16 and 14. Now, they have some very good wins because the Big Ten is very strong. Right. But you have 14 losses. We saw this last year with an IU team that was right along the cut line, I believe finished 17 and 15 mm -hmm. and didn't right. quite get in. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. historically, and that's not to say that history can't be changed because it has over the years, but if you're looking for a precedent, the most losses ever for an at-large has been 15, and it's happened twice in the last two years. Both of those teams also had 19 wins. They were four games above 500. It's been very, very rare for a team to get an at-large bid without being at least four games over 500 total. And so that happened, I believe, in 2001, the last time with Georgia, who had the number one overall strength of schedule in the country. And if you ever go back in the archives to the old RPI and you look that up, their schedule on who they played that year was insane. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Sure. So most of all their games, all but a, 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 like a handful, were all in what would be quad one today. Mm -hmm. So with that as a backdrop, you know, you figure at a minimum, Purdue's got to win two more games right. to get to 18 and 15 to sort of at least really have a shot, and you'd like to see them to get to 19 and 15. I mean, I, I think if they get to 19 and 15, right. they can be another that next 19 and 15 team that gets in. But for them, that means going three and one. Mm -hmm. So that means winning today and winning two in the Big Ten tournament. Right. Well, you, you, and you talk about quad one games. Talk about that. What's what's that mean? Well, basically what it comes down to is last year the NCAA switched from, and they kind of always had these, they didn't used to call them quadrants, they called them something different, and I forget off the top of my head now what it was, but when they used to have the former RPI, right. the ratings percentage index, was what the committee used to organize teams. And I always like to tell people, it's there is a number but it's not all about the number. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, why would the committee need to meet? Right. Right. Sure. We just say, here's your automatic qualifiers, and right. we take the next 36 teams ranked on our net, mm -hmm. and then that's it. And there you go. And then we just yep. all we have to do is get together on Saturday and then put the bracket together, <laughs> right. and, and we're done. Right. So it's not the end all be all, but it is an organizational tool, and we don't know exactly how the new net formula works because when they changed it, they haven't released it. Mm -hmm. We know sort of what's incorporated into it. Right. But in terms of how it's weighted and how the math is done within those calculations, we don't really know because there are some oddities this year. And any metrical system sometimes has an oddity, right, where the performance on the sheet doesn't necessarily match up with the number. And so then it becomes, how's the committee going to deal with that? Mm. So let's say you have a really high net but your performance suggests, if it was completely based on results, something significantly lower. Right. So those are the ones where it gets really difficult because you're like, how's the committee going to view this? Mm -hmm. And so like your Ken Palms of the world and your BPIs at ESPN that are more predictive metrics, they're looking at trying to predict who might win a matchup based on how the team is offensively efficient, defensively efficient, all that. Where the net incorporates some of that now to be more forward thinking, but it also has some results-based components. Right. And so that's sort of a nuance. But basically to answer your question, the committee divides them into quadrants based upon 
upon that net ranking mm -hmm. okay. with the with the idea of and they've made it so it, in other words winning a game on the road I believe if it's a if it's a top 75 team and it's a road win it could be a quad one mm -hmm. but to be a quad one home win it has to be in the top 40 or 45 I, I don't have the number right in front of me but the point is we all know it's harder to win on the road at home so beating a team ranked 50th on the road on their home floor is probably more difficult than beating a team ranked 35 on your home court right so they do that and then there's an upper tier to both quad one and quad two and then you have the quad threes and the quad fours and those are you know um, teams that are usually lower ranked um, into the metric and so when you look at a team sheet and if someone wants to see them you can go to ncaa.com and you can go to the net and you can look at the team sheets the exact same ones that the committee has right yeah right yeah and so you can go through and you can look at your team's team sheet and it'll highlight the wins and the losses and where the game was then they do put the date on there but as we talked about it's it's not necessarily relevant right um, it'll mark if it's overtime mm -hmm. so you can go through gives your road record how you did on the neutral um, what your strength of schedule was for both um, overall and non-conference and the committee will even be able to value what was your strength of schedule within the conference because in today's world we don't have the old Big Ten where everybody played a double round robin right so everybody's Big Ten schedule or SEC schedule or Big East schedule isn't the same mm -hmm. right and so they're going to take that into consideration so you know if you only got Northwestern and Nebraska once mm -hmm. That might be different in terms of wins than somebody that played them twice. Right. And that's why the standings today, typically, your anymore that your league record isn't an official criteria. Ah, oh, sure. I mean, it, I'm not saying it doesn't matter. Right. But because it's not, e if you're not comparing apples to apples. I mean, if you had four games against those two, and somebody else had two extra games against Michigan State, Maryland, and Ohio State. You know, it's really, and that's why, you know, when you look at these seedings for the Big Ten tournament in some of these, it's, it can be a little odd. Right. Sure. Because somebody may have had an easier road. All 12, 10 wins in the Big Ten or 12 wins in the Big Ten are not created equal. Right. Exactly. Dave, if you, if you had to look at your number one seeds right now, who are we looking at? All right. Well, they've been kind of set in stone for over a month. We right. haven't seen a lot of change, which is maybe a little odd. But I think heading into this uh, weekend anyway, Kansas is your number one overall seed, and I'm not honestly sure that's going to change between now and next week. Well, um, I know a Kansas fan that's really happy right now. Um, now, you know, Baylor and Kansas, you know, could end up playing for a third time. Mm -hmm. And so theoretically, you know, if Baylor wins the third rematch, they could be a flip-flop because they're one and two on my C list and on most that I've seen. Right. Um, but that really kind of becomes a matter of semantics in this sense is that unless Kansas were to choose to go south because they have a bigger fan base in Texas where the south regional is in Houston, which it would be their choice. Right. The committee would give them their choice if they're the number one overall seed on which region they want to go oh, to. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh. Um, so they could go south, but Midwest is closer in Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. So if we work under the assumption that they're going to want to be as close to home as possible or they don't have a driving reason, then Baylor will be number one in the south. And whether one's one and one A, you're still going to get Kansas in the Midwest and Baylor in the south. Gonzaga, in my opinion, is still ahead of San Diego State to be the number one seed in the west. San Diego State may need to win today, even though they only have one loss on the year, to hold that spot, particularly if Dayton were to win out. You know, okay. Dayton only has two losses this year, and they were to Kansas in overtime mm -hmm. and Colorado in overtime. They've perfect in their A-10. They've beaten a lot of really good teams this year. So, you know, they're, they're certainly in that mix. And then, you know, it's possible like a Florida State, if they run the table here in the ACC and um, – that they could be in that conversation or maybe a you know a Seton Hall or a, a, a Villanova or something like that if they were to win out um, and there's a couple others we could but you know that you can right. extrapolate forever here sure. but the reality is if San Diego State wins today and beats Utah State I think most likely your four number one seeds are going to be set before we ever get into championship week yeah and you and you 
you know, you, you look at the, the number ones, and, and that's, as you mentioned, that may be set in stone. And for a while, what's tougher to pick? What what seed is tougher for you as as, as a bracketologist? Is tougher to, to look at and go, I don't know. There's, there's too many teams that could be seeded right here. What What is that? Well, this year it's kind of the three line. We got about, you know, 10 teams for, if you look at the end of the two and the three line, 10 teams for about six spots that are all very similar. So that's going to be a, a thing to watch here in the next week on how these last teams kind of maneuver because you could put all their resumes side by side and pull them out and for various reasons they're all going to be really close and and I could see it you know like I have Louisville as one of the top four seeds primarily because they just don't have the high end wins right and some of that's the ACC coming into play being a down year right but if you're asking the hardest thing to do every year it's always the last few teams in mm -hmm. it's that who's going to end up in the first four and who's going to end up first out right sure because it, it, that's where a lot of things that this next week like we talked about right you know right as of I sit this morning my last team in the field is NC State if Utah State wins tonight NC State becomes the first team out heading into the next week right so you know that's just one of those those are always the toughest because you're comparing teams that have a lot of warts and scars in a mix of some good and and you're a lot of times two teams that are going to look very similar and so you're trying to figure out which way might the committee go on one of these right. two teams and that's usually where the make or break is a lot of folks wondering about IU. They've had some good wins. They've had some ugly losses. Well, here's the thing with Indiana. I, I've maybe got them a little higher because of those wins, and they don't really have anything bad on their resume. Now, you know, if they beat Wisconsin today, I, I feel that they're probably going to be in a pretty good position to be okay regardless of what happens. Lose today and lose your first Big Ten tournament game, Yeah, it, it could still potentially get interesting depending on you can get leapfrogged. Mm -hmm. Other teams teams keep winning you're standing still and all of a sudden you find yourself closer to the cut line one last thing Tim you know Rutgers is another Big Ten team sure. people are talking about right and Rutgers has a lot of really good wins everyone's been at home right they're one and eight on the road and they're one and ten away from the rack yeah well they play at Purdue so if they lose that and then they lose their first game they could go in to like the final go their committee could be like eight or 18 and 13 with not one meaningful win away from home right. and historically that has not necessarily bode well for teams because you've basically proven I can win on my home court but can't win anyway. Final thing Dave if you're if you're like me and you're an amateur and you're trying to figure out a bracket and you're uh, you know as I've heard I've talked to so many people I'm just you know my number one seeds the number one seeds are going to be in the final four and that typically seldom happens when's the last time was that ever happened? It has but it's only happened like like once in the last decade uh -huh. and all four final four teams have been one seed so usually you kind of end up with one or two mm -hmm. is pretty typical um, just because in the nature of the tournament it's it's a one and done it's not best two out of three right and any given day right. somebody can be really hot and you can be not and yeah. you can find yourself on the on the losing end you know I think you know, uh, Kansas has probably been, you know, just consistently the best team. Right. Um, you know, Baylor's been right up there. And, you know, Gonzaga's been very consistently good. So if you're looking for, you know, three that you're thinking about, but we also know that there's going to be a host of other teams. And the way this season has gone, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't bet too much money on any one game if I were you. <laughs> People want to follow you on Twitter. What do they need to do? Well, it kind of sounded good when I started it. It's too late to switch it now, but it's that bracket guy, Dave. I, every time I say it, it sounds kind of corny now. But uh, you know what? It, it is what it is, so yeah. I, I guess we're, we're stuck with it now. And, and, and people around here, a lot of people don't realize at bracket guy, Dave, is you. Yeah, that happens occasionally, <laughs> but, you know, sometimes they figure it out. Yeah. And, but uh, I don't go out of my way to... to yeah. I try to keep a little bit of the anonymity, you, uh, right? You try to fly under the radar. I know. I understand. Dave, we appreciate you being on this morning. It's been very insightful, and we'll see what happens next week. Try to get us a little bit of sleep this week. Well, we'll do that. It might mean, uh, <laughs> might mean a nap at 5 o'clock in the afternoon till 9, but we'll, we'll see how it works. Appreciate it, Dave. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. All right. That's uh, Dave Almond again, Bracket Guy Dave, NCAA men's basketball bracketologist, stopping by and uh, visiting with us today. We appreciate Dave coming in and again <laughs> interesting uh, discussion on coach's corner that uh, bracket uh, of course the selection sunday coming we'll see who who is in and who is not and who's uh, who's going to be uh, 
Well, not very happy because they're not in, indeed. And there'll be a lot of discussion coming up next Sunday evening. We'll do it again live from McDonald's. It is Coach's Corner. We'll do it next Saturday morning, live here from the McDonald's on Madison's Hilltop. For Jordan Barron Studio, I'm Tim Torrance, live from McDonald's here on Works 96.7.